Hello, everyone. Um, it's right at 1.30. Want to get everyone get started on time. Anyone that's coming in or at the door, you know, thanks, everyone, for coming. As always, there's a number of seats in the front. Um, so there, there's, if you're looking for seats, feel free to come on down. Uh, today we're going to be talking about monitoring performance of enterprise applications in AWS, more specifically about dynamic cloud. Um, one quick piece of housekeeping. Here's our safe harbor statement. Um, there it is. Done. Okay, so uh, moving on, who are we? Who, who are you, you going to be talking to for the next 45 minutes or so? Uh, my name is Andy Wetzel. I'm the director of industry solutions for New Relic. And I've been in the uh, software industry for, for about 20 years and, and working for longer than that. I uh, spent about 10 years at Mercury Interactive and HP. For those of you who uh, may know Mercury or have heard of HP or heard of Load Runner, things like that. Uh, about two years at New Relic. Uh, my first job, uh, professional job, uh, that I, you know, I couldn't wear shorts to, was uh, I worked at a large aircraft engine manufacturer, and we were doing uh, total quality management. And little did I know at the time, or maybe I would already be retired had I known that lean manufacturing would be the progenitor of something like DevOps. Uh, it was very interesting. So I've spent a lot of my career working in performance management and performance optimization. And uh, my, my co-presenter today is, is uh, Donald Patty, and I'll let, uh, let uh, Donald introduce himself. Thanks, Andy. Uh, my name is Donald Patty, and I'm a program manager and a scrum master with Telesis. And I do work both in the agile um, and lean area, as well as in custom software development and in coaching and consulting. Um, before we actually get started with the slide, um, I want to make sure people are in the right room. Um, yes, this is about enterprise performance management and enterprise performance monitoring, but we will not be talking about the hotel's wireless network whatsoever. So if you have problems with that or complaints with that like I do, um, take them upstairs. All right, let's get rolling. So um, as I mentioned before, I've been consulting for quite a while, 20 plus years. And I've done work both in private sector and in public sector. And irrespective of which side of the fence you're on, there's nothing like that Capitol Hill moment that exists in the public sector anywhere in the private sector. Many of you know what I'm talking about. The Capitol Hill moment is the time where you or perhaps the chief of your agency get called up to the Hill because you've got an app that fell over at launch or perhaps fell over during a major event. It's the same thing that happened to healthcare.gov. Um, many of you are familiar with that. It made lots of headlines. But it also happened to gsasam.gov. And it's the type of event that makes all of us squeamish about making changes or making new strides or considering things like a move to the cloud, both for infrastructure as well as for our applications. Now, we're here actually to tell you about a success story at an agency that leverage the AWS cloud and enterprise performance management and enterprise performance monitoring to deploy a new system entirely to the cloud. Um, before we start on that, though, um, Andy's going to talk a little bit about how to, um, oh, actually, next slide, please. Oh, there we go. Um, to uh, build a better data center, and then later he'll talk about how to leverage a dynamic cloud. Thanks, Andy. All right. I also promise we won't do one slide each and then keep switching off. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about two things from a, from a high level perspective. Um, you know, wanting better apps faster and then using either a better data center or dynamic cloud. So we'll go into each of these as, as topics on their own. Um, but I do want to, I always like to give a, a personal story that talks a little bit about, you know, why does it matter that you want a better app or even faster? I mean, what is better? even mean, I mean, it would mean that any user of your application, when they go to your application, it's available, it's correct, it's fast. They can get it from wherever they are, and if you're offering this to them with whatever device they want. But I think apps can even matter a little bit more. Um, so when I got married uh, six, seven years ago, uh, my wife was, uh, is Colombian. So, as 
a, you know, a born citizen of the United States, I was rather blithely unaware of the uh, process that one goes through to become a resident and become a citizen. And I was also very unaware of, of different visa statuses that at that time would prevent my wife from visiting Colombia or her mother from visiting the US. So they had about a four year separation. And these are two people that talk on the phone every day. So you can imagine the emotional strain that I was putting on them. Yeah. So when we applied for my wife's, my wife's residency, we would go to the immigration app, uh, online every day. And we would check the status of her petition. Every day, clicking, you know, search your petition number, crossing our fingers and seeing if it had been accepted. So sometimes, and especially if you're working in government, these applications aren't just, the, it's not the search button, it's the reunite the family button. It was so important to us that that application, if it was available, performing, could tell us what we wanted to do. So it's something I'm, I'm pretty passionate about with application performance. So talking about cloud as a better data center, what does that actually mean? Uh, what it means is that uh, you're taking applications and you want to use the cloud, but you're not really making that many special considerations for changing the application itself. And you want to leverage the uh, cloud for using resources similar to the way you would uh, in a data center. Uh, but the provisioning is much faster, as you can imagine. So it's a better data center in the fa fact that uh, you might be able to, you're going to be able to get access to uh, compute power a lot faster. And I'm not saying this would ever happen in any uh, you know, organization, department that you're in, but I've worked with some that, hey, it's six weeks, eight weeks, I can get something provisioned that just is forever, right? Um, so also, the lifetime of these components when you're doing better data center is relatively long-lived. And as a result, your capacity planning is very similar to what you would do with uh, an on-premise data center. All right, so, board. Why would you want to use this better data center? I kind of alluded to one reason, which is you're going to be able to add capacity faster. But to the reason of why these applications matter and what you need to care about, they're available, they perform well, they're correct. You can improve application availability and redundancy by being able to scale. But also there's the issue of compliance. So uh, if there's an operation that you're doing that requires data to be resident in a particular locale, it might be really difficult to spin up a data center in that location, but you can do that through the cloud. Um, also, if you need to have disaster, uh, for disaster relief uh, purposes, have data that's physically separate from your core data center, that can be another reason. All right, so who's impacted by this? Um, for using the better data center, the, it's typically in the operations, uh, in the bailiwick of the operations team where they still want to know, hey, how can I provision my servers? Um, can I run my app from wherever I need to, to run my app? Um, you know, how is it going to perform? But from a developer perspective, sometimes they'll experience this as, you know, the, this new data center, even though it's in the cloud, I, I, it's the same to me. You know, if I go and do a build, you know, and it gets deployed out, it's, there's no difference for me for my, my day to day work. All right, so, um, then there's the aspect of, for a better data center, how do you monitor this? And once again, I um, uh, failed to mention at the top for New Relic, the company I work for is, is monitoring of applications. So software analytics, meaning analytics for software to, to do monitoring. So we'll step through how, we're do, how you do monitor monitoring in a better data center. So once again, something that would never happen except for the places I've seen is that anytime you introduce something new into your environment and something goes bump, you know what's going to get blamed. It's whatever change, whatever's the new component. So even if you do a lift and shift and you take the same application code, uh, same application architecture and put it in the cloud, uh, if it's not performing well, the first uh, culprit might be uh, Amazon itself. All right, so you wanna monitor that piece. So for uh, Amazon CloudWatch, it gives you the ability to capture data out of the Amazon provided infrastructure and put that into the Amazon Man, uh, AWS management console. So that will give you the infrastructure view uh, from a virtualized infrastructure and hardware perspective. All right, but now you still have a uh, virtual OS that's going to be put into that, and you're going to have your applications that are going to be put into that. So you need to monitor those two as well. And that's where New Relic comes in. So you have the ability to monitor a virtual operating system for things like memory, CPU, as well as the application code that's running 
to let you know how long the code is taking to execute, what it's calling, how long that takes to execute, uh, if you're getting errors. And what's really important is that you can view all of this in one, uh, one holistic view. You know, uh, Don had mentioned healthcare.gov. That was something where when, when the launch of healthcare.gov was really in jeopardy, uh, New Relic was one of the companies that got a call to see if we could assist. And one of the most important uh, you know, capabilities we brought to bear was the ability to have, by having all this data in one location, it creates a common set of evidence that then will allow your teams to work better within the team and between teams to make data-driven decisions. The reverse of that would be silo data for data store, silo data for API, silo data for front end, silo data for infrastructure. Uh, you have a problem, people come together and they start to defend their own data. It takes a very long time, it's inefficient, you're playing that big game of not it. Central set of data, common set of evidence, drives da makes data driven decisions. All right, so now we're gonna, uh, Don's gonna talk a little bit about how um, you did this similar process at SBA. Great. Thank you. So um, I think the next slide is for certified.sba.gov. The first thing I'd like to do is call out some of um, our team members who are here, um, not only to embarrass them, but uh, so that you could ask them questions uh, after the event if you have any of them. Uh, Mike Naraki is here. He's a um, security architect and played a big role in our successful delivery. And then Jorge Arias is our director of FedCiv programs. And he's basically my wingman or my lead blocker. All right, so certified at SBA.gov. Let's tell you a little bit about what it is. It is the new portal at the Small Business Administration designed to help small businesses win government contracts more effectively. And specifically, it does that by helping them to earn certifications. What types of certifications? Well, some of you are probably familiar with 8A, which is an economically and socially disadvantaged business. Um, others of you might have heard of Hub Zone, which is a historically underutilized business zone. It's an area or a region where um, businesses need a little bit of a boost. And others might be aware of uh, WOSBY, or women-owned small businesses. Um, historically, organizations have used legacy applications that exist out there on Oracle and Cold Fusion. These are siloed applications to be able to apply. It's been a slow and tedious process. Um, Certified at SBA.gov moves that onto a single cloud-based platform with largely um, a combination of open source technologies and cloud-based solutions to make that work effectively. It uh, leverages the FedRAMP compliance that's there on um, the US East cloud, um, which is also there on the Gov cloud. And so we were able to achieve uh, ATO much more quickly than had we uh, been working with traditional hardware and traditional infrastructure. Next slide. Okay, so what did we do to prepare for launch? So uh, I'm a little bit old school and, and old fashioned. So we did the traditional um, performance, stress, and load testing on the application. We had one of our team members um, use JMeter to write a series of scripts that would go through the application, uh, simulating uh, various different types of users. So we um, went ahead and did that um, as part of our testing. But the other thing we did that was even more important was we implemented New Relic. And um, we were able to leverage New Relic to see problems at the various different layers within the application, in addition to just identifying where we had bottlenecks in one given section or screen of the application. Next slide. OK, so we were preparing for two major events. The first one was the go live, or the launch of the application itself. But the second one was the chief administrator's um, press conference, um, or her press announcement of the launch of the system, which was done out west before 5,000 um, small business owners at a major uh, SBA event. Both of those uh, generated significant increases in load and traffic on the system, and both of those required preparation. So how do we avoid the Capitol Hill moment? Well, um, first of all, uh, we did encounter a um, bottleneck specifically on a um, left navigation bar or a menu that was dynamically generated for each and every user. And um, we were able to use New Relic to detect problems both at 
um, the database layer and at the middle tier. Um, we're using Ruby on Rails, and so we were able to identify that there were problems there as well. Um, that made it much, much easier for the team to narrow down where to put their time and to be able to fix those problems um, prior to go live. Um, we, of course, hit some simpler problems along the way, things like um, some slight misconfigurations with load balancing. Um, but uh, the biggest ones that uh, New Relic was a great help on were in helping us to separate out the various different layers and know specifically where the problem was. The second thing we did was we used New Relic for proactive monitoring. So at the um, go live and at the time and shortly thereafter for the press announcement, um, our team members were able to proactively monitor performance of the application and they were in a position to make adjustments if the need arose. Okay. Next slide. Yep. yep. So what was the outcome of that? First of all, um, zero. There was no significant degradation in, in performance during either one of those events. So we set an MRT90 of um, three seconds on the application, and um, there, we were never anywhere near that at either one of those events. The second thing, and I think this is bigger because this is business impact, was that there was a six-fold increase in the amount of certifications that occurred at GoLive. Um, and during the first month thereafter. So that's 600% growth, simply because we moved to the cloud and built a new application that was easier and more friendly. And then finally, it was overall success. In just seven months, we had delivered a production-ready application in the cloud and um, helped to improve uh, SBA's reputation with its customers' small businesses. So. Um, in short, SBA had built a better data center and we'd help them to build that. Um, that meant that we had auto scaling of the cloud infrastructure available to us. Um, we had also developed and leveraged the uh, virtual redundancy that is inherent in the AWS cloud. So we leveraged load balancing, we leveraged CloudFront, we ever leveraged S3 and all the redundancy that it is inherent in AWS. And then finally, um, and this gentleman is uh, uh, one of the big reasons for that, um, we were able to leverage the FedRAMP compliance of the AWS cloud um, to help us achieve an ATO um, in uh, under six months. So now I'm gonna hand things off to Andy to talk a little bit more about how you can go one step further with a dynamic cloud. Andy? Thank you, Don. Yeah, very, very cool story on SBA, and it, it repeats itself all over time. I mean. We'll take it back to healthcare.gov for a second. I mean, they released the, the first version of the application with no application monitoring. And having worked in the testing and monitoring space a bit, I know it's not that interesting. You know, at cocktail parties when I say, hey, I do performance optimization, you know, I never was surrounded by people asking uh, me to tell them a lot more about it. But it's, it's kind of like diet. You know, if you, wanna, if you wanna be healthier, it might be good to take a vitamin, but you wanna take it every day. You know, you don't just get to the end of where you want to be healthier and down the whole bottle of vitamins all at once. So, you know, testing and, uh, and uh, monitoring is really good daily hygiene for your applications. They didn't have anything for healthcare.gov. You can imagine why it ended up where it was. Um, so, yeah, cloud is a dynamic tool. I have to also give uh, recognition to someone not in the room, but this uh, gentleman, Lee Atchison, who's the cloud architect and cloud evangelist at New Relic, responsible for a lot of this content. When he and I were going through this a couple months ago, when we got to the dynamic cloud piece, I, I just had this, th you know, in my head I th said, ah, I've never thought about it exactly this way before. Even though I've been working with a lot of customers that are doing this uh, type of activity, I never put it in this way, which is, you know, whatever, wherever you are today, either thinking about the cloud, you know, the discussion that Don just had about going to the cloud and what you can do, that's your frontier of innovation. Just moving to the cloud, that might be new. But once you get to the cloud and start op operating, you start to get in that mode of doing things much more quickly. And then what's your next frontier of innovation? It could be using the cloud as a dynamic tool. What does that actually mean? Okay, so if you're doing dynamic applications, meaning you're only using the resources that you need, and you're allocating and deallocating those resources on the fly, what that means is they're ephemeral. They're, they're there for a certain point in time, then they're not there anymore. And then the resource allocation is an integral part of your application architecture, your application design and development. So that's, that's very different. 
So one example of this is Docker. And Docker isn't necessarily a cloud-only solution, but it's interesting because it is, once again, that next wave of innovation, if you will, for a number of customers. They go to the cloud and then they say, okay, now we're, we're going to look at containerization. And why might they want to do that? Well, spinning up a container is even faster than spinning up an EC2 instance, which is fast on its own. And you can consume a container like a process, so developers tend to love it. So uh, a little bit of foreshadowing to who likes who loves containers a lot, it's oftentimes developers. Okay, so, but with Docker, it's very interesting. Our solutions at New Relic are Docker aware. So when our customers deploy an app, will monitor an application that uses Docker containers, we'll understand that a, a container was uh, instantiated, how long it lived, and then uh, when it was deallocated. And this is the overall graph from the, when we first really our, released our Docker support. And what you have on the y-axis is the number of containers, and then x-axis is time. All right, so you have, there's still, you know, the, the average was about 83 days. So you might say, well, there's no big change here. People are still kind of using containers in the better data center model. But if you actually expand this into the first 10 minutes, you can see that 11% of these Docker uh, containers are only living for one minute or less. So think about what that's like. Okay, so from a monitoring perspective, you might say, how do you monitor something that's not there anymore? How do you, more importantly, how do you troubleshoot something that's not a, there anymore? We'll talk about that in a little bit. But let me give you an example of a, an application that works this way. Uh, at our company, we have a, a solution for synthetic monitoring. Um, probably all you in here know what it is, but I might be contractually obliged to, to say what it is. So it's just the ability to ping a website, ping a web page, or even do a Selenium script that checks the availability, performance, correctness of an application basically with a robot script from various locations around the world. Um, when I worked at Mercury, we had what was called Mercury Managed Service at the time. Same concept, took load runner scripts, ran them, different data centers from the world, different locations, allowed customers to know, hey, you know, my applications are slow from Asia or they're completely not working from Georgia for some reason. Um, so it's, it's really, really helpful, very powerful. It's canary in the mine shaft, deterministic, repeatable monitoring. Um, but at that time, and still, there are many solutions out in the market today that are using static data center instances, either leasing data center space, or they have their own data centers where they're running these, this traffic from. And these are commercial synthetic monitoring offerings. So what we have with our solution for synthetics, which is relatively new, it's, it came out within the last two years, is if a customer chooses to run a ping test, a website test, what happens when they click go or schedule it, when that script is ready to run, it instantiates a Docker container on AWS, runs, and is gone. So we have two benefits of that. One, quite frankly, is security. If you think about it, if you have something that exists that's connected to the internet with the power to run scripts against basically any website that's out there, if it gets hacked, that could be problematic. So if you have something that's there, runs, gone, it's a lot more secure. Second, from a cost perspective, it costs us a lot less to run that solution. Therefore, to use the cliche, we can pass the savings on to our customers. We can provide a solution that's much more economical. So that's just an example of a dynamic application. Um, Docker, of course, is not the only dynamic uh, entity within uh, the cloud. So you can do queues, dynamic routing, dynamic load balancing. But once again, the using dynamic cloud is about scaling, and it's an integral part of development. So who uses this now when better, better data center, uh, just homework for anyone that wants to for the overambitious, say better data center like three times, four times, and it, it gets harder than you think. So uh, it was mostly experienced by operations. Okay? Operations is uh, doing better data center. But when it shifts to dynamic, it's much more in the sphere of development. Because they ha the applications are necessarily re-architected to make use of dynamic components. You think about the example I gave you, which was the synthetics. You know, we can't make a different architecture decision than a container using Docker right now. Our operations team can't do that because it would simply break how the application is developed. So you can start to see where the, 
this is maybe more in the development, or at least development is much more involved in this. And maybe you can also make the point that then this is what is necessarily going to bring these teams together if they're not already. All right, so uh, we talked about monitoring for the, the kind of lift and shift type data center. Now we'll go into what it means to do dynamic cloud. And it's, uh, I went back. Okay. So it's very similar to what I, I, we showed before. So there's really nothing new. The same components of how you're going to plug in and you want everything together. But there is something that's very different about it. It's that, of course, you want to monitor all the cloud components, but now you have to monitor the life cycle of the resources itself. Once again, helping you answer the challenge of how do you troubleshoot something that's not there anymore. So, so if you know the life cycle of the components, you have to add that layer of capability into your monitoring for better data center. All right, now the fun just continues. All right, so we said EC2 fast, Docker maybe faster for provisioning, and then you go into something like Amazon Lambda, which is you're not provisioning anything at all. You're just running code. So Amda, uh, La Amazon Lambda runs code typically uh, based on an event happening, stateless, an event happens, it runs code, and then your code is run. You're done. You didn't provision any infrastructure whatsoever. Now think about monitoring that. The depth of that discussion might be for a different time, but at a high level, it's much more like monitoring applications than it is about monitoring infrastructure. Because the infrastructure really, at this point, knowing anything about the infrastructure for a massively shared service like Amazon Lambda will do you no good in understanding how your code ran when you executed it. All right, the, the good part about this, and, and I'm sure like anyone who's, who's been in this space for a while, the, the pace of change is, is speeding up. And when I talked about first starting at, at a company like Mercury, you know, that was when Java was brand new, web was very new, all right? And you learned the three-tier architecture, web, application, code, data. And that thing kept me in new shoes for 10 years. And I, I didn't have to learn any type of new architecture. Now I feel that any time I have a conversation with someone in the field, I learn a different architecture every day. So it's either it's, it's on one side of the coin daunting, on the second hand thrilling that you're learning something new every day. But you know, you also need the, the modern tools to keep up. Because as this uh, speed and complexity is increasing, the need to be able to monitor is also uh, ever more urgent. All right, so uh, rounding up the dynamic cloud. Um, as I said, the things are changing very fast. Nothing wrong with traditional data centers, right? If I'm allowed to say that at an AWS conference. They work, there's nothing wrong. But if you want to go faster, you can use better data center where you're just using the provisioning, you're using the scaling. And then if you really want to get faster, you start doing dynamic cloud and, uh, and go from there. All right, so I'm just going to uh, hand it back to Don. He's going to do the lessons learned from uh, what he did with, uh, with SBA. Great, yeah, so switching gears a bit to um, back to certified.sba.gov. There are uh, five lessons learned that uh, we were able to identify that we think were key to be able to deliver to all of you. Um, the first one, and we think this is uh, very promising, is that government, of course, can be nimble. All of you are very capable of doing that despite all of the rules and regs and bureaucracy that's out there. Um, it does require some creativity, but if you leverage what's there on the cloud, um, you can actually be up and running and out in production very quickly. Um, the second one is that um, it's very possible to avoid the Capitol Hill moment. Um, well, that's something that uh, can be uh, fear, a, a source of fear for all of us. Um, it is uh, not necessarily a natural course of events when we have dramatic change. Um, again, that's uh, partly due to being proactive, and uh, tools like New Relic allow us to do that. Third, um, it's really important to make data-driven decisions. There's a lot of data available to you in a cloud environment, both being provided by AWS and by tools like New Relic. Um, if you leverage that, it can allow you to be able to scale and respond effectively to um, performance issues that you're seeing, as well as um, take corrective action before it ever hits production. Um, fourth, 
as Andy was saying, there are even more gains to be had by um, leveraging the dynamic cloud. Oops, sorry about that. There's number four. And then finally, there are a lot of organizations out there that can help you out quite a bit. Um, so first of all, uh, Amazon Web Services was extremely helpful in us um, getting rolling at SBA, or at SBA to get certified at SBA.gov out. Um, they came in very early on and uh, met with SBA staff um, in their OCIO to help them learn about the cloud as, to, as well as to help us um, to be able to pass on the knowledge and to gain that trust. Um, in addition to that, um, New Relic came out and um, after, actually before we'd purchased a license, came out and trained our team on how to use the tools and show us how valuable it was. Um, we did have a couple folks on the team who were um, already uh, relatively aware, but that knowledge transfer that they did helped us to better leverage the tool set. Um, and then third, organizations like ours, uh, Telesis, um, the uh, contracting skill or the skills of a contractor like ours, um, there are many organizations like ours who can be helpful in um, your move to the cloud, as well as um, building uh, applications that can leverage cloud infrastructure. So um, it's very common to uh, be hesitant to avoid adopting uh, a uh, cloud-based infrastructure to be hesitant to move on to something new. However, you don't necessarily have to have a uh, Capitol Hill moment when you make these big shifts and these big changes. In fact, it's very possible that you could have a White House moment where you're getting a call from someone from the EOP to congratulate you on your success. But it does require you to plan ahead. It does require you to leverage the right tools. And the opportunities are there with the tools like AWS and New Relic. Now, um, Andy said, told me uh, before the meeting started that he had a very important announcement, almost as important as the um, presentation we had itself. So I'm going to hand off to Andy to finish off. Andy? Yes. Thanks again, Don. Um, I'm going to leave you with that cliffhanger for, for a quick second just to uh, um, you know, harken back to what Don just said about that White House moment. When he said that uh, New Relic got the call uh, when uh, issues with health, healthcare.gov were dire, uh, we worked really hard with them to help them turn it around. And when our team that was on site went to, we're, we're, that team was invited to the White House, and the president's chief of staff hugged our lead engineer when we got there, saying, you, know, you really saved us. I won't say exactly what he said, but uh, it, that was the gist. Now, on to, yeah, I think we'll have one announcement, then we can open it for questions. Very important announcement. So uh, we're at about 12.35 uh, or something, if I can do math. Um, at, no, what time? No, I'm totally off. We're at, we're at 2.02. Yeah, so I can't <laughs> do math. All right, so really glad I moved out of engineering, which I studied, and into software. Uh, I think you still need math for. But, um, we have a New Relic booth here at Exhibitor Hall. You might may have seen it, but at 2.45 today, um, the, the uh, Washington Nationals, the presidents that are in the stadium that do the races, they're going to be at our booth. So anyone who wants to come, they want to take a picture with the president so you can show your kids to see how cool it is to go to the conference. If you want to do it just for you, there's no judgment. Um, you can just go and get your picture taken with the presidents. I know I'm going to do it. Um, and it'll be fun. So I, you know, on behalf of Don, I'd like to really thank you for your time and for your attention. Um, but also, uh, we'll open it up for questions. There's a mic in the middle of the room. Um, if you can blast it out, uh, I'll try to re uh, repeat it. Or you can you can go up to the like a proper debate. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Is this on? Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, I guess my first question was, where exactly was this booth, again, you were referring to? <laughs> <laughs> it's in the exhibit hall, so if you go in the, where the vendor exhibits are, then you'll see that. Okay. Yeah. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was one I could answer. I like that one. More, more questions like that, please. Uh, do you guys recommend any testing tools to go along with the New Relic? I'll answer from the, the New Relic perspective, but then I'll let Don answer from his kind of real world. We, we're agnostic. Um, we do see a lot of uh, customers using JMeter, but from our perspective, if you put our, app, our instrumentation and telemetry on the app, whatever you're driving load to it, 
um, work. So we don't necessarily uh, recommend any. Uh, so there there's are nothing some, that kind of integrates with it? Yeah, we do. We have integrations for JMeter as an example. We have some plugins for Sosta as well. So um, there are a number of solutions out there that we have plugins. Okay. So what that means, once again, a plugin is just you kind of use APIs to gather the data from that solution and we can put it into New Relic uh, additionally. Great, uh, thank you. Want to add to that? No, that's, that covers it, yeah. All right, good. So what's the best way to purchase Docker instances from AWS? That I don't feel called to, to know how to buy Docker from AWS. I wouldn't know, to be honest. Uh, I don't know if you have Yeah, and I don't, I don't want to yeah, pretend to be, be an AWS our, rep, but um, yeah. I'm sure they have a booth around the corner, too. I'm sure there are probably a lot of people walking around that would be happy to answer how you can purchase something. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, if, if it's from New Relic, I'm here. I'll stay after. Um, but yeah, for the AWS, sir, I would just uh, look for one of them. Sure. Okay. There's a, there a comment down in the front said, you can try before you buy uh, for Docker instances on AWS. You give a number of hours that you can try. Um, shamelessly, I'll just say, same for New Relic. We have a premium model. You're allowed to, to use the full version for a number of period of time. Uh, use the free version forever. But not forever, please, you know. Forever. What new features from monitoring um, tools should we expect in upcoming um, releases from New Relic? So we've heard a little bit about AWS Beta and Meebles, but are there something that you can share with the group? Something that I can share that's coming up? Yes. For New Relic? Let me, let me just kind of think. Um, Yes, there's something, uh, so someone can just ask the guy if he's from one of our competitors or something, but um, <laughs> yeah, it's no secret. There was something we said about the dynamic cloud that you have to monitor it in a different way. You have to monitor also the life cycle of components, not only just the, the components and resources themselves. So I can't go into that many specifics. Um, there will be a solution coming out that will help you do just that. Uh, I think that's the most uh, applicable to what we have here. Um, yeah. Thanks for the question. Um, what is the uh, improvements over CloudWatch that uh, New Relic has for network monitoring? Um, is it packet level? Do you know if, uh, you know, it, it seemed to be in slides they were kind of the same from the networking perspective? Yeah, yeah, from the networking perspective, from the actual, if, if your role is that you look after the network within what's going on within the cloud or to the cloud, and you're working at layer two, three, you're probably going to be better at the Amazon layer. If you want to know the impacts of decisions when you're moving pieces of your architecture um, one place to another, and you want to know the effect of that, how that performs across the network, that's what new, where New Relic would come in. As an example, we have a customer that, oh, we it was great, we, put the, we took this piece from on-premise, we put it up in S3. They didn't realize that it was very chatty. Okay, so they were making a, a large number of calls, so when they got the bill, bill was very, very high. I'll say that, bill was, bill was a bit high. Um, so yeah, is that, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, thank okay, you. Okay, thanks. So um, my question is, is New Relic just another APM tool? Or if not, how is it differentiated, like with Dynatrace or uh, the other big guy that I can't remember right now? Sure. I'll, I'll answer the, the most honest way. Monitoring is, in essence, monitoring. So you probably could do a good job of monitoring your solutions with a number of things out on the market, to be frank. Um, but once you move to the cloud, you need a cloud-based solution. That, that's number one. So you have to first ask yourself, is my monitoring solution SaaS-based? What's unique about New Relic, I think there are a number of things that are unique. One is it's uh, born in the cloud and it's multi-tenant SaaS only. Okay, so that's, that is differentiated about it and, and any customer can make the decision if that's the best solution for them. But I think it's a better solution long run. 
Um, when we talk about enabling things like dynamic cloud and enabling different ways of operating between uh, development and operations, uh, my experience has been that there's, there's really four things that you're going to need. You're going to need first that your solution is frictionless. Okay? What that means is when you put a toolkit out for teams, you need it to be so that they can self-serve when they need it and if they need it. So it needs to be extremely easy to use. So if you're looking back, I can, I'd like to speak mostly about things I've had ex direct experience with, say like an HP suite. Um, when I was there at Mercury in the HP acquisition, it was all of the products in the suite were acquired by different companies and then integrated first on PowerPoints and then many years later actually integrated. Um, so that, that provides a very different experience. The New Relic is, is all the solutions were built by New Relic and all work together. So you gotta be frictionless. Now frictionless is gonna drive a level of ubiquity. That means that you want your monitor it to be everywhere from a telemetry perspective, but also from a usage perspective. So that's not something else that's a bit differentiated in that when I worked for some uh, APM companies, one I didn't even put on the list because it was a great company for a while and then it met an ignominious uh, uh, end, but uh, the solutions were usually about, you know, used by three people, five people, a dozen people in the performance space. Now we have customers that we have 500 monthly uniques coming into this the solution. So while it may not be differentiated, I think it is, it's important to note that that's the change that's happening. The performance data itself is being democratized in the extent that it's coming out of the hands of just performance experts and into the hands of developers, product owners. And that's going to drive, that drives collaboration within teams, between teams, okay? And that's going to drive the agility. So long answer, I, I hope I hit on some of the major points for you. Thanks. How would you compare your application performance management to say um, something like Logly, who does uh, application log collection and then provides analytics on it in the cloud? Sure. Um, there, so Logly is doing log-based monitoring, like Logly, uh, also like a Splunk, okay. where it's, it's capturing the logs. There's a couple of main differences. One is logs is different than application monitoring specifically. But um, with logging, you, you have to have logged it to get the data, and it's always going to be kind of after the event occurs. By nature, you know, that information has to be in the log. We're, we're sitting in a privileged position where we're in the application itself, so we're seeing the the uh, transactions come in and we're capturing the data about those transactions. Um, a lot of demographic data, performance data. And so we can see trends as they're happening and you don't have to have, have set anything into a log. That said, I mean, we work with uh, log solutions all the time. I think also for Logly, um, and there's a solution called Log Entries as well, very similar, where within the New Relic interface, if you're on a screen, you can right click and say, go to the log. Um, so, Oftentimes you'll do, uh, you th think about needle in the haystack. The problem isn't needle in the haystack. The problem is you have a field of 1,001 ha haystacks. So you have to first figure out which haystack and then you gotta go looking for the needle. And we'll get into like this big pile of, of hay and then a lot of times people will say, hey, I want the logs. Let me figure out. And developers love logs, so that's, yeah. that's kind of the main differences. I'd like to sort of second oh, that, yeah, sure. that our team is using the two in concert and um, essentially uh, leveraging them both together. Um, the, uh, you know, Splunk is definitely making it very possible for us to um, identify uh, where we're either uh, seeing errors within an application or um, where we're seeing uh, other types of problems, um, compliance issues potentially. However, it's really not going to supplant what we get from um, New Relic uh, with the real-time monitoring. Cool, other questions? All right, I think uh, Don and I probably have a little bit of time to, to be here if anyone wants to ask a question personally. Once again, thanks so much uh, for coming. 245, tall presidents, maybe one of them will race you. We'll see if you can beat them, but anything you want to? Nope, thank you very much. All right, thanks everyone.